Yay, we are live and recording. Hello, everybody. Okay, I, as fall is approaching and we have spookier, spookier weather, I am so excited because we are celebrating Small Town Monsters by Diana Rodriguez. I want to make sure I get it right. Is it Wallach? Wallach, oh, no. yes. Like, not Wallach, yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that never happens. Okay, and I'm so excited because Small Town Monsters, for all of my creepy loving fans out there, this, I just had to just automatically take this to give you a little taste. It's The Conjuring Meets the Vow, and it is a terrifying story of a girl, a dark angel, and the cult hell-bent on taking over her small coastal town. And this next quote I have might sound vaguely familiar. We'll see if it resonates with <laughs> with one of our um, people joining us. But with death cults, possession, exorcism, and demons, Small Town Monsters is like all of my favorite horror movies rolled up into one. Unputdownable book! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, Gretchen McNeil, who is in the bottom corner. And also joining us is Chelsea Mueller. And many of you may know Gretchen for murder trending, murder funding, and no escape. And then Chelsea also had Prom House come out this year as well. So there is a theme of death and lots of awesome, mysterious, creepy things <laughs> happening for this event. And I'm so excited. You guys are in such good hands and are in for a treat. Before I pass it off to our authors, though, if you look to the right-hand side, yield chat section go ahead say hello let us know how you're doing down there and then also if you have any questions <laughs> all right <laughs> I, it's just it. like something dinged and it's game over it's fine we can just take over and we can talk about book things okay. so we had a wonderful introduction of both myself and chelsea but diana i want you this is your day I want you to pitch your book and then also tell us, because this is not your first book. I know this is your first book with with uh, Penguin Random. Oh, there she is. <laughs> it's okay, we were vamping. Sorry. So um, my computer crashed on me and that's what I get for talking about spooky goodness, but it sounds like you are already <laughs> taking You're good. it away. We're rolling. Um, yeah. So yeah, everyone purchased the book down below. It's fabulous and it's amazing. And it came out today, if you have questions, Y'all know where to ask the questions. Gretchen was already doing a fabulous job taking over, so I'm now going to disappear again, and I will see y'all at the end. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, Diana, why don't you give us the full pitch for this book, and then, you know, give us the pitch for, you know, the vague pitches for the, was it five or six books that you wrote before this? I can't remember. I did. Yeah. Wait, hold on. I'll pick up the whole stack, no. uh, and I'll show you. Because I've been ready, have been, like, ladies and gentlemen. She is the notorious thing happened to me. So all of my other books are written by, were published by independent presses, Kensington and Entangled. So I had my first podcast where the podcaster said, "Oh, congratulations! This is your debut, right?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's my seventh. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks. Yes. So like, you never know when." Someone's going to hear about your book. So if you want to yeah. go buy one of the old ones, feel free. Uh, but now we're here to talk about the new one. Yes. Hi. So give so, us give us the pitch. Yes. Yes. So Small Town Monsters, everyone asks like what the inspiration is. And the back says The Conjuring meets The Vow. And normally in publishing, they like try to come up with like a comp and it's like a marketing meeting. Whereas for me, The Conjuring Meets the Vow was the literal inspiration for the book. It's so it, that's where it all came from. And that's how that came to be. So I was literally watching The Conjuring in my living room for the first time. And if you don't know, The Conjuring is the sort of based on a true story of Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are super Catholic demonologists who work for the church. And they go around um, researching hauntings and exorcisms. So they worked on Amityville. They worked on the Annabelle doll. And The Conjuring tells their stories. And as I'm watching the first movie, it shows that they keep all their artifacts in the basement of their, like, totally normal suburban house. So, like, Annabelle is just, like, right off the kitchen. And they have a little girl. So in the movie, they go off to do their case and the little girl starts having all these demonic things happen to her. And I'm watching this and my daughter was about the same age as the character in the movie. I paused the movie and I'm like, 
wait, did they actually have a daughter? And I Googled it and they really did have a little girl and they really did keep their demonic artifacts in the basement. Up until 2019, you could go tour them in their actual home, in the basement, see the Annabelle doll, the whole thing. And their daughter's husband is now the head of like the New England Paranormal Society and all of that. So that's sort of where the idea came from. I was watching this and I was like, what was that girl's life like? Like, I can't imagine my daughter coming home from school and wanting to have a sleepover at their house. You know, like, hey, can I sleep over here at the demonic house with all the stuff in the basement? And so like that freaked me out. And really the first thought I had, which is kind of, so, you know, coincidental now was what if a hurricane were to hit? They live in Connecticut. And I'm like, imagine a hurricane hitting Connecticut and destroying this basement full of demonic stuff. Like what would happen? And then literally Ida just comes through and I have friends whose basements were very much destroyed. Sure. So I guess the town that they lived in was probably kind of happy that they kicked out that demonic occult museum uh so before this happened but that was the inspiration literally for max and vera so vera is i made her a latinx character she's half uh puerto rican and half irish i'm half polish and half puerto rican and max is also dominican and jamaican and a mix of everything because i wanted to add a little bit of my heritage in there and i wanted to make them the center of the story and see what would happen if this demonic stuff in the basement got loose Fantastic. So it's very much uh, a, a book based on horror tropes for a YA audience. And Chelsea, Prom House also different horror tropes, but very much based on horror tropes, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, an, it's, an, it's a survive the night story. <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a survive, survive the weekend story. Uh, right. Also felt like we needed a hurricane. Well, sports- I written that. I mean, my book is the same thing. There's a storm. It's not a hurricane, but it's a storm that keeps people trapped on an island. Like it's a very, nature is a very powerful source of danger. Nature is really powerful. And I think also like in my case, it was um, how how do you keep people from getting help? Yes. <laughs> and and nature is how you do that. But yeah, mine is much more of like a slasher throwback to right. Christopher Pike, Fear Street, like those kinds of books that I felt down when mm-hmm. I I was that age um when I was a teenager and and I loved them I love something that you could just like hit the hallmarks of and read in in an afternoon mm-hmm. and then pass to your best friend um and so that was that's prom house we've got 10 kids who rent a house for the weekend and slowly one by one they start dying and you have to decide <laughs> you know is it coming from it in the house yes it's you it's know? Very similar. I did one with 10, 10 teens trapped on an island with a serial killer. I'm going to blow your mind a little bit, Chelsea, and I apologize if you already know this story. But when we were, 10 was my second book. It came out in 2012. And um, when we were looking for blurbs, my editor was like, we should get Christopher Pike to blurb it. But I'm, I, you know, for those of you that don't know, did Christopher you- Pike was a prolific... <laughs> Let me tell the story. You're going to ruin my ending. Uh, he was a prolific teen YA horror writer in... 90s i mean through now he's still active but like he was writing these like pulp paperbacks in the 90s that i swear to god i felt like they came out every month they did not but they mm-hmm. it felt like it but he's also <laughs> a little bit elusive mm-hmm. so my editor tried to track him down through an agent who turned out to be a former agent and like we didn't hear anything fine i got a wonderful blurb from nancy holder who's just such a wonderful awesome. amazing author and so i'm out to dinner one night with my then boyfriend, now second husband, and I come home and I'm checking like email on my phone and I got this message through my website, which for most authors, it's like a form. So it says like from blah, you know, subject blah. So it says from, and the email address, I kid you not, it's like cpipe4738 cpipe at aol.com, aol, right? <laughs> and I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then the address. And then he says, <laughs> I got your book from Kristen, who is my editor, so I know this is not spam. I read it in a day, loved it, would like to blurb. So I like I break down in tears because it was oh, utterly God. unexpected. And my husband is like, why are you crying, Gretchen? I'm like, Christopher Pike emailed me. And he paused 
And he said, why is the captain of the Enterprise emailing you? For those of you that don't know, Christopher Pike was the original captain of the Enterprise before Captain Kirk. Now, I had no idea what my husband was talking about because I was not well versed in Star Trek at the time. And he, being six years older than me, had no freaking clue who Christopher Pike the author was. But we did get a blurb from Christopher Pike and it like it remains oh, a favorite blurb. Like, this so. entire shelf, like right here. <laughs> that's all that the pike. Is all Chris that's chain letter right there. Yeah, that's chain letter is one of his best. Yeah. I actually I did put him on the phone at one point and and he was like, Oh, ten's a great book. It's better than most of mine. And he paused and he goes, It's not better than Bury Me Deep. I'm like, it's not, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, so this is a great uh, segue to my first question, question, which is, why do we write horror? Like, what was the entry drug? Was it a film? Was it a book? Was it a personal experience? Why? We'll start with you, Diana. Why this genre? So after I had the idea for what became Small Town Monsters, I initially started writing it as like a thriller, like a, in a completely different avenue, and then sort of switched gears and made it horror. And I was recently asked this question of why is there so much horror coming out right now? Like, it seems to be a huge boom in YA and adult. Why is everything we're living it? Right <laughs> both made that face like, um... what I said. I wrote this book in 2019 during the run up to the election when everything was so angry. The world was so angry. Whichever side of the spectrum you were on, you were angry and it, there was so much vitriol. No one was listening. That's sort of where the cult aspect of the mm -hmm. group grew out of. It wasn't my initial inspiration, but it was this idea of group think, this idea of not in any way listening to the other side or anyone else's logic or reason came out of the election for me. And I feel like there was so much darkness in the world and particularly in the U.S. in 2019 that it's no surprise that two years later, the books that are being published are really, really dark. And also, personally, you know, as being an author who's Puerto Rican, like there aren't very many horror novels where the person of color survives past chapter one, you know, that's the running joke. She dies in the opening scene. They always do, yes. you know, or, you know, I joined like Las Musas, which is a group of, you know, Latinx children's book authors, females. And one of their statistics was only 5% of all children's books feature a Latinx main character. Mm -hmm. That's it only 5%. So normally, if there is one, it's the best friend, it's the Latin lover, you know, it's the spicy sidekick, you know, it's never the main character. And if it is, it tends to be an issue book, you know, that it has to be something tragic, they have to be going through that their ethnic identity has to be the point of the of the novel. Right. Yes. So I just wanted to write a horror novel that where the characters were Latinx, but they just we're in a horror novel and that was their story and their culture is kind of dipped in there and weaved in there in details, but it's not the point. And so yeah. that kids would see a story that they like to read and also see themselves in that story. It's, you know, when, when they were casting Get Even, which is a, a Netflix BBC show based on two of my books mm -hmm. and the characters are, there's four main characters and it's a diverse group. And I was talking with one of the actresses before she was cast and she said, you know, she's she's black. And she said, we don't get to do this. We don't get to play a lead that just has like frothy romances and is being chased by a serial killer. Like we don't get to do, and survive. Like we don't get to do that very often. And I was so struck by that. I just, you know, yeah, it's not, you know, I think very, very cognizantly when I create a cast that I'm making it diverse. It's an intentional thing um, because that's the world that I live in and I want my books to look like that. But I never thought about sort of that ramification of how, you know, actresses mm -hmm. and, and kids who watch a show and read a book will be able to sort of enjoy like a, a lighthearted romp, even a horror romp where everybody dies, but like, and, in, and enjoy uh -huh. it for themselves in a survivor, not just in like a speed bump, you know? Um, and, and I, yeah, and I, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you, I never read a book with a Polish Puerto Rican in it. So, like, so I'm going to write one. Right. <laughs> I'm going to write that book. 
looks as some other girl out there. And I actually have met another Polish Puerto Rican. So Janae, if you are ever listening to this, <laughs> you know, I was like, there are more of us. <laughs> How about you, Chelsea? Where did it come from? You know, it's funny. Um, I think I, I'm an accidental horror author um, in that I don't always set out to write horror and then I mm -hmm. end up writing horror. Um, so in this, much like, much like Diana, like prom house originally was framed to be a thriller. And mm -hmm. I think so much of the, the stories that I love, this will sound horrible, have this sense of dread that is yeah. balanced out with hope. And right. so I, yeah. as I started kind of crafting this situation where, um, you know, people were just trying to have a good weekend and they were trying to make these memories because you're about to have everything change. Mm -hmm. And now things are changing very rapidly. People are dying. You're scared. And um, this like sense of like, could we problem solve our way out of this? Is there a, is there a path? Um, and I think that's one of the things that I like about horror. I think in terms of where I started, I mean, I think it's funny. I remember like I had a ton of friends that went through like their, I am way too young to be reading Stephen King, but I'm reading Stephen King phase. And I instead picked yeah. up a Dean Koontz novel. Like I'm the one person who was like, I'm going to start here. Um, yeah. And um, it really messed with my head. It's a much more screwed up place to start. It really is. Right. Yeah. It's totally messed up. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, and it's, it's, it's the things that, inspire us young, whether it's in a positive or negative way. I remember a babysitter letting me watch uh, American Werewolf in London when I was way too young to understand that yes. it's like a comedy sort of. All I just saw was people getting eaten by a werewolf and it scared the <laughs> crap out of me. Um, yeah. Though I think, you know, if I'm going to talk about influences for my writing, I think it all goes back to Agatha Christie and it goes back to like one summer between like seventh and eighth grade where I was babysitting a lot and I was just blowing through, you know, two or three of her novels a week and just consuming them. Now, mm -hmm. yes, they are genre mystery. For the most part, they are sort of the pinnacles of golden age of mystery, but there's a darkness in Agatha that does not exist in a lot of other mystery writers, either of her genre or later. Um, and, and then there were none uh, is a is a wonderful example because it is really dark and it is really messed up and it's amazing. Uh, you know, the mouse trap, the play that's based on a short story is also super jacked up. And you know, hi Damien. Um, so it's it was not horror necessarily because horror actually scared me as a kid because I had that experience, mm -hmm. but it was the crafting of this dark side of nature that drew me in. And so, um, and then when I wrote my debut, which is called Possess, and, and it's about a teen exorcist. I love that. I, I went into like a deep dive of exorcism books before yes. I was writing my own and your doll scene the doll scene so is super good. creepy. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's so hard with hard to make something scary on a page that's scary yeah. in a movie. You, you know? have like more. That. Yeah, you have more tools in a film. You have acting, yeah. you have camera placement, and you have music. And in writing, we only have the page, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Which is actually a wonderful segue into my next question, which is these elements of horror right? Like, what do we do as writers to make it scary on the page? You know, it's not just about, you know, the gotcha scene. It's not just about, like, you know, characters talking about how scared they are. There is sort of, like, a variety of things. What are your sort of, like, favorite ways to enhance a scary scene or to build to that big, big moment? Oh, definitely like atmosphere. So my other day job is I teach creative writing for Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth. And I teach these kids how to add the five senses into all of their work. And I feel like that's the tool that we have to build that world, to build, to make the sound of a clock ticking, build that sense of dread mm -hmm. on the page by making right. sure you include all of those teeny tiny little sensory atmospheric you know, details to make it a little creepy. So mm -hmm. it's a slow build because you don't have a jump scare. 
You know, no. you can't do that. And, you know, in a movie, I mean, a lot of our favorite horror movies are mostly jump scares. You mm -hmm. know, the guy jumps out of the closet with the knife and that's what does it for you. So if you're going to do it in a book, it has to be an atmospheric, eerie, creepy, slow build. Mm -hmm. And I do that mostly through all of like the sensory details of the fog and the scents and the sounds and every taste in her mouth. And that was one of the things I focused on a lot in Small Town Monsters because with the you know dark angel in the book they leave offerings and i try to go into a lot of sensory details of the offerings that this cult is leaving of the tastes and the scents and the smells that are making them gag and choke to kind of give you that sense of dread before they open the door when i think that so i think we all are nodding pretty firmly with the atmosphere but i think it's interesting the way that we can use atmosphere to replace a ticking clock Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, sometimes you have like a, you know, if there was a bomb and there was a countdown, you would have it on screen. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Clock. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to do that in a, in a visual atmospheric way, like a lot of us use storms. Like for me, there's flooding. And so having the visual marker of where water is at in relation to where everyone is and how close they're getting as things progress so that you're constantly feeling this, you're being crowded back everyone's up on top of you and adding that with your layer of, of the emotions of what's going on, of lost grief, how we're handling everything. But that visual of here's the storm literally coming to me, you're hearing it, all of those things to try and kind of build that internal pressure when you're reading of yeah. like somebody is sitting on my shoulder. Yeah. It's setting as character, you know, it really is where you take mm -hmm. a setting, whether it is the weather or uh, a house or like in Murder Trending, it's this island, mm -hmm. this island prison that they're all sent to. And you give it aspects that we would assign to Ascension being, right? It's not Ascension Island, but like mm -hmm. it has a lot of cameras. Yeah. People are always <laughs> watching you. Like it, it, you create a paranoia mm -hmm. by using the setting. And in a way, that's exactly what a filmmaker would do. It's just that we have to describe it more. We have to imbue it with, you know, Shirley Jackson nailed this in The Haunting of Hill House, which is that yeah. the most important character in The Haunting of Hill House is the house right? It's not yes. Eleanor. It's not the doctor. It's the house. And so, you know, and she says that like the first sentence is something like, you know, you know, it is a, it is a fact, you know, that everybody knows that, you know, any living being cannot live for long in a state of insanity. Even Katie dids are known to dream. Yeah. Hill house, comma, not sane. First character of the book, you know, and it's, yeah. it's a masterful working of that. And I think all of us, do that. And, and I don't just mean the three of us. I mean, within sort of the genre of horror um, and, and of thriller and suspense, you were both saying that this didn't start out as necessarily a horror novel. And I think there is a very fine line. Um, horror is a term yeah. that gets bandied about frequently when it is uh, convenient to do so. If publishers think that horror is the next thing, they may promote your book as such. Um, Horror to me is very specifically about the dread as opposed mm -hmm. to like the fight for survival. Like fight for survival is inherent to mm -hmm. horror, but it's the dread of it. I think that is really like yeah. the most important element. And you you use all of the things that, that both of you have talked about to sort of create yeah. that sense of imminent dread where... I forget, I think it was Chelsea who said like, there's this play of like dread and hope or, or maybe what's it, I forget. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. but in horror, there is always the possibility that's very real that mm -hmm. the hope is a false hope, right? Absolutely. And you yeah. don't always have that in other genres. Like I don't pick up an Agatha Christie book usually and think like, oh, we're never, Poirot's never gonna figure this one out. You know, like we know, <laughs> we love the formulaic nature of that. It's a good thing. But horror I think is that like, right, like you don't know where a book is going. I feel like um, uh, Stephen Graham Jones was most recent. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if you guys have read uh, The Only Good Indian by Stephen Graham Jones. Like, you're not sure where it's going oh, until it goes someplace really jacked up, you know? <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and that, I think, is what makes horror. So interesting that I mentioned a male horror author, um, because yeah. this is a genre that has been known 
as sort of male territory. And it's not just Stephen King and Clive Barker and Dean Koontz. I mean, they're sort of like of, of the modern horror. They are, you know, the grandfathers. But, you know, Bram Stoker, the Horror Writers Association uh, Award is named after a male author. And it's it's definitely... When I had a Mary tell people what I write, they're like, oh, but... <laughs> <laughs> you don't write horror? Like, I don't look creepy. I don't, I'm not gothy. I don't know what it is. But, but women in horror, I think we have a special um, perspective that we bring. Um, and I know all three of us are mothers, and there's nothing more yeah. horrifying <laughs> than what happens to a woman's body when they have a kid. Um, but, you know, what perspectives, like specifically as a woman, and I know, you know, we don't want to break ourselves out as authors, it's just women, but like, how, how did you bring that sensibility of mother and woman into writing a horror novel? I think a big difference with male, all right, so I read, you know, we've all read all of the Stephen King books, you know, all of the classic horrors that had mostly been written by men. And I will say that Stephen King was a huge influence. I mean, the town of Derry in it yes. was a huge influence. I totally felt Warren that, yeah. And small town monsters. Like, I wanted the whole town to be possessed, the whole town to be affected. And in New England and that dread and that fog where everybody is messed up. So, I mean, the... They've written wonderful books, but I think one of the difference is a female character, you know, in a female book is going to be different than a male book. Mm -hmm. um, I, Not just that you have the final girl, you know, which is the girl who survives haphazardly by tripping mm -hmm. through the house. But in a female, you know, written book, the final girl will have fought her way yes. and have intentionally and intellectually made it to the end of that book you know, through her own devices, not just because she ran faster than everybody else did, you know, yeah. and had the biggest chest, you know, <laughs> and happened to make it to the end. But I, I think that's a big deal. But I also think what scares women is different than what scares men. So I personally, like, I love all of, like, the slasher movies and the Michael Myers and the Jason, mm -hmm. but I'm not actually scared by mm -hmm. by that. I, I enjoy them as entertainment. Like, I wrote an, a book about possession because The Exorcism is the movie that scared me more than anything yeah, ever. Yeah, this is one of the scariest movies ever made. And the book yeah. is as scary yeah. as the movie. And I like studied mm -hmm. that book. I'm like, how did he make this this scary? It was, I, I mean, if I just catch five minutes of that movie, I'm up all night. You know, so that was one of the reasons that I wrote Small Town Monsters is I wanted to create something that would also scare me. But I think what scares women is different than what scares men. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not scared of a a mask with a knife. I, I think that is a very unlikely thing to happen to me. You know, I do believe in ghosts. I do believe in demons. I was raised Catholic. So, you know, I, I do believe that evil exists. And I believe in Ted Bundy, you know, like I'm more mm -hmm. scared of the guy who looks totally normal next to me becoming an evil possessed, you know, mm -hmm. person who's going to attack the sorority yeah. house than I am of somebody in a mask with a knife. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it comes out to um, as a women, as as readers, as authors, don't want to be seen as a plot point. And yeah. I think a lot of yeah. times that's how sometimes we can. I'll speak for myself. Sometimes that's how I can feel when I read some of those books. Whereas wanting to kind of imbue that that sense of agency um, mm -hmm. and and really focusing their their story kind of like what diana is saying um and you had a great line in your book chelsea that i just read where your character says falls asleep and she says something like for a woman falling asleep at a party is the most dangerous thing you could possibly yeah. do but for a man falling asleep at the party the worst thing will happen is someone will draw in your face yeah and i thought that's so summed up what the differences between men and women of what we're scared of very much so well and in and in in prom house the guys aren't understanding why it's a big deal that any of the girls mm -hmm. have fallen asleep and that somebody isn't there when they wake up mm -hmm. like they don't understand why they're scared yeah. about that to the same degree it's like well they're not getting a dick scrawled on their face like it could be yes a whole lot of <laughs> well, there's a dick, but it's it's going somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
It's true. Yeah, and my it, husband goes away for the night. Law and Order SVU is the scariest thing I could possibly watch alone in my house. Yeah. That and like Criminal Minds, like that is what will keep me up at night. Yeah. And you know, SVU stuff and, and a guy crawling up a fire escape way more than Michael Myers. And I, I do find it interesting that even in this sort of post Me Too awareness society, we still have books about, say, Final Girls, right? Books about or movies about, you know, pregnancy and horror being written, directed by men. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not, and I'm not saying that those books aren't wonderful. I love Grady Hendrix. I think he's a fantastic author, but I really don't want to get the perspective of a final girl from a male author. I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, and it's, it's a very entertaining book. It's just personally, I'm like, what about like, yeah. us, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and there are a lot of women doing amazing things in horror. Somebody mentioned Sylvia Moreno Garcia and, she, you know, Mexican Gothic. And I haven't read certain dark things, but like, you know, I'm not sure I would term Mexican Gothic as horror personally, but I, it was a fantastic book, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. Alma Katsu is, you know, if you haven't read The Hunger, which is yeah. her Donner Party that horror novel, awesome. like that'll mm -hmm. jack you up. <laughs> so. It's some great stuff. Okay, so we're running short on time. So I'm going to skip to my last question that I had prepared, which I'm going to let all three of us plug what we have coming up next um, so that, you know, we, we know what books are coming out. And then if you guys have any questions here and you want to put them in the chat, we will be very happy to answer them. So, Diana, why don't we let you go last as far as pitching? I'll go first since, you know, I been talking a lot. Um, my next book, I conveniently have it right here on screen. What? This is Dig Two Graves. I hate that it's backward, but um, Dig Two Graves is my young adult. Oh, it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's just good. Me. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, this is Young Adult Strangers on a Train, um, like a queer way, Strangers on a Train, about two girls that meet at summer camp who discuss the people in their worlds who are making their lives miserable. And one girl jokingly uh, suggests that they trade murders and because nobody would trace it back to them. And then ha ha ha, they leave camp, go back to school a week later. And our main character's bully has been murdered. And she gets a text from this girl from camp saying, your turn. <laughs> so um, I had a lot of fun with it. It's, um, I think it's probably less horror than than it is maybe suspense. Um, it's not as gory as my murder trending books. My murder trending books are very gory. If you're squeamish, uh, mm -hmm. veer away. If you are not, sign up because like it's people dying in horrifically graphic ways and having it streamed on television. So, um, but this one's definitely more thriller. And then the next book that comes out after that is called Three Drops of Blood. I just turned it in last week and it is a YA rear window. So we're sort of going at some Hitchcock right now. Chelsea. Nice. Nice. Um, so right now, I mean, I've seen, it's a reminder, Prom House. <laughs> Prom House just came out. Um, and we've already talked about it. So you guys know what that is. Um, you guys it's a Jersey Shore book because I know I've got a lot of East Coasters on here. Who no, spent a lot it of is. It is. It is a Jersey Shore <laughs> book. It is absolutely. Um, ten kids rent a shore house uh, for prom weekend, um, which is funny because I grew up in the Midwest, and when I first learned about prom houses, I was like, "Wait, what?" But it's it's mm -hmm. totally. I'm sure everybody, all, all the East Coasters, are like, "Yeah, I know." Um, <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> Shore House. Um, they kind of end up kind of a little bit secluded, um, and then hurricane hits. So lo uh, locked in as people are dying, um, and they're not sure if that's somebody in the house or is there one, one of their friends? Is it not? You know, it's it's a it's a locked room, you know, murder mystery. Mm -hmm. um, coming up next, um, I don't have dates, uh, but casual conversations about love and murder, which is a YA thriller, kind of Sock Hill, Sock Hill Girls meets Veronica Mars. Um, it's it's my friendship breakup book. So um, friend betrayal, but then friend dies and there's no closure. So she has to solve her murder to find out what was really happening um, and, and why their their friendship fell apart. So that's that's next on the dock. Fantastic! Thanks. Sounds exciting. Yeah. I'm just gonna hug this. <laughs> 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 And 
Yeah, you finished it. Came out and said, Yay! <laughs> Are you? Yeah, so, I mean, Small Town Monsters is my book that I wrote during the election. I sold during the pandemic, which was bananas. You know, I found my agent on Pitmad. Lane, if you're mm -hmm. out there, thank you for all of this. And it's been a super fun, wild ride. So, if you love, exorcist if you love nexium like i was really into nexium in 2019 i love that podcast on cover that was all about you know keith ramiri and all of that so that had a huge influence on this a lot of the cult speak in the book was based on my cult research of nexium and jonestown and actually listening to the audio of Jonestown. It's really disturbing. I don't recommend it. But it, uh, like all of that influenced a lot of the cult speak in the book and the demonic possession and all of that. So if you want to get all like creepy for Halloween, yay. Try are you it. are you writing are you anything else right now you can talk about or? I, I'm keeping with the, in the Y Harving. So people have asked, because my books have ran like all over the place. Obviously like Proof of Lies and everything where spy thrillers and they went all over the globe and this one is currently being shot by you know a friend of mine all around hollywood and then i wrote my debut was like forever ago the which were contemporary you know chica lit mm -hmm. you know romances by a so everyone's asked like well you've kind of gone from like contemporary to thriller to horror like what are you gonna do next and i think i'm staying with horror i really like it I, it was I, as Gretchen said, I loved writing, reading Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein growing up. And I feel like I finally like wrote the book I would have read as a teenager. And so I think I'm going to continue in this vein. And so my next book is also horror, but I'm not going to talk about it yet. <laughs> it's awesome. Not there. Fantastic. But, you know, it's exciting. Awesome. Okay. Questions. Let me see if I can pull this. Oh, look at this. I even got the questions up. All right. Um, what was your research like, Diana? Let's talk about your research. Oh, okay. So as I mentioned, I did a lot of cult research. So in a, I've watched everything from The Vow to, there was like another one on stars about Nexium and the Uncover podcast. Mm -hmm. So the cult in my book starts out as just like a grief self-help book. I unfortunately had a lot of friends and family who had lost children in infancy or at a very young age. And it was super tragic time in my life to see them go through that. And I had this horrible thought of, you would do anything. We're all mothers. You would do absolutely anything in that moment to make this situation not happen. You know, and you say that prayer up, like, take me, take me instead. Almost every exorcism movie you see ends with that trope of the person saying, take me instead. And then they jump into that one and that one jumps off the staircase. You know, so that is the common trope. And I sort of felt that I'm like, what if that prayer was being answered by a dark force? Mm -hmm. Would you still make that deal? And are you sure that's yeah. your answer? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that, so, that's kind of where this was sort of coming from of like, would you still make that deal? And so I did a lot of research. So that was my personal background. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of research on cults and I did a lot of research on exorcisms. I mean, there are countries in the world where you go to an exorcist, like you go to the doctor, you just like, you're going in to see a psychiatrist and you're chit chatting beforehand and you can watch these like, um, documentaries and then they start, you know, the exorcism and it's like, they're overtaken and it's, Super creepy. So and the, that was sort the of Catholic Church is the only crazy. major religion with a codified exorcism ritual that dates back to the 16th century. And it Love is that. ramping up. If you actually Google it, it, like there are, they are now ordaining more exorcisms in the 2020 and 2021 than they have before. Like they have completely ramped it up. I think the world's gone mad. So Pope <laughs> Benedict instigated exorcism training at the Vatican. He was the first Pope to officially do like, let's train some exorcists. <laughs> it's yeah. a weird thing. So then also me, like I saw, I learned that like at one point in 2015, a Bishop in Mexico performed an exorcism on the entire country, the whole country. Like he thought the whole country needed an exorcism, which is like a really weird thing to think <laughs> of. And that was one of the things that came up in my research, you know? So 
Yeah, so I did a lot of like deep dives into actual cults and even demonic groups. Like, one of the creepiest things that I found in my research, so like as I was writing this, like I said, like Lorraine Warren was alive, you could tour her basement mm -hmm. and she passed away like before the book came mm -hmm. out. In addition, like I based it on this group in Chicago, the Chicago Ripper Crew, which was this demonic, um, you know, devil worshiping group that went around killing women. One of the guys got released from prison as I was writing the book. It was like, so some of the research was like super creepy. Like I like that. It was like lining up a little bit too much. This is good for our next question. Chris Kristen asked, how scary are our stories? Are they more creepy than slashery? Are they filled with gore? <laughs> or both? So I think that's a great one because like I said, not everybody can stomach certain types of horror. So Diana, why don't you start and just sort of like, Tell us where on the scale of like, you know, won't sleep for a month to you'll enjoy this, you know, and but have a few scares, which you sort of put put small town. Monsters. So this is not a slasher. This is not a slasher. There's no blood. There's no gore. So it all depends on what scares you. Um, how Catholic were you raised? You know, how much do you believe in demons and demonic possession? I'm a huge that? chicken. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Kristen, I have friends, like lifelong childhood friends that have bought every single one of my books and not read a single one of them. So I feel you. Yeah. yeah so like there's no like, gore, there's no blood being slashed open in the book. But if like you're really scared and you totally believe that evil is a presence that exists in the world, then that's what will scare you in this book. Yeah. What about you, Chelsea? Um, mine definitely gets classified as a slasher. Um, it's I, I, my level of gore. I don't think it's that gory, but th there's a body count. There's a body count. There's definitely blood. <laughs> um, it shouldn't keep you up um, so much as you know. But it's closed door. It's closed door slasher. It's so off, it, off I mean, if somebody was right yeah. There, well, I mean, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of balance with. Um, some some lighter romance stuff to to balance it out a bit but um yeah it's not super gory just there's it's not, not happening anything. on screen yeah yeah well yeah because you're finding you're finding dead bodies yeah yeah so it's not like you're actively seeing the like eh, eh, in the shower <laughs> i mean there's it's something to be said for that uh not that there's anything wrong with yeah. that question <laughs> Mine, mine definitely sort of run a gamut, I have to say, because, you know, Possess is very much, there is, there is some discovered gore that happens off screen, um, but it is definitely about, you know, the horrors of exorcism and demonic possession and, and whether or not that scares you. Ten is a straight up slasher film. Um, it's, you know, the, like with Prom House, it's 10 teens trapped on an island with a serial killer getting knocked off one by one. And our main character has to find out if it's one of the people in the house or someone outside the house. And um, mm -hmm. uh, there's some death on screen, some death off screen. Um, there's a, a like a, a conflagration that ends the book that uh, has some some graphicness to it. Um, murder, uh, sorry, uh, Get Even and Get Dirty which are the the two that were adapted for netflix and bbc um they're much more murder mystery it's they're not horror novels at all so those are those are much more fun I actually it was the first time i got to be funny they sort of my publisher allowed me to like be funny and i had so much fun with it that when we did when we did murder hashtag murder trending um disney like and this is like disney right so i'm like they're never gonna let me do anything and then and i just <laughs> I just threw it all out there. You know, it's a book. Talk about the election, Diana. Like I sold the book the week before the 2016 election. And then when I wrote it, I wrote in this, this Trump character. It's about a reality TV star that gets elected president of the United States and sells the criminal justice system to a reality TV producer. And they create this island. I didn't realize you sold it beforehand. That's so we, so I sold it on Halloween 2016. I got the offer. So, it's yeah, so and then a week bad. later, the world went tits up. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, and then there's, I mean, there are graphic murders in this, but it's really funny. So, like, there's a whole scene in the book um, based around The Shining, the twins in the hallway. There's a whole scene in the book based around Die Hard, because um, one of the serial killers, all the serial killers are thematic. So one of them is like a film director. So they recreate a scene from Die Hard. Um, 
the whole there's an end sequence where we do the model walk off scene from Zoolander, and I'm like, there's no way they're gonna let me write this, <laughs> and we totally, totally did, um, and that also mm -hmm. ends with with a fire and. It's like horrible. you took the Hunger Games gore, but added like humor to it. Like the yeah, Hunger I mean, Games I you know I don't. I it's like funny because everyone compares it to the Hunger Games, and I don't see it at all. To me, it's The Running Man, the Stephen King uh, short story uh, that yeah, was an Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger crazy, crazy movie from 1990. Um, to me, that's what it is because it's not dystopian. It's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not yeah 200 yeah. years in the future. It's it's like five days in the future. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so, I mean, they're all over the place and the murder trending, all three of those books, they get increasingly graphic. The third one, no escape is set in, in a escape room competition. And like, there's even my <laughs> editor was like, I had to turn away at one point from your book for a minute. Kristen, so, um, so, so, but it's so but when it's, do we all think our kids will read this? Like, when race. are you going to let your kids read your books and they're actually they're like, Mommy's an author? And then like, <laughs> I think it's funny that you both wrote those books with the election, and I wrote Prom House while pregnant. Yeah, I turned in final edits two days before I gave birth, so like my hormones were at peak. So, well, I wrote. I wrote No Escape after my son came home from 46 days in the NICU. And I had three months to write a book and with a newborn at home. <laughs> so I feel oh, you, like it was, I don't even newborn. remember what was in that book half the time. I'm like, what did I write? I don't even know. I'd fall asleep at the keyboard. It was awful. <laughs> This is, so my kids are older now. They're six and 10. This is the first book that I think they will actually remember that I wrote. You awesome. know what I mean? Like they were alive cool. the other ones being, being written and published. But this is the first one I think like they'll be at the book launch party for and they'll actually remember. They're like, wait, my mom does have a job. Like she's <laughs> not just at, you know, home getting me apple slices. Yeah. <laughs> Except that you're also home getting apple slices, yes. which is the fun, yeah. <laughs> the fun of mom writer. Okay, we're going to do one more question. It's a quick one, and then we'll say goodnight, especially to those of you on the East Coast. Thank you so much for joining us here. It's easy for me. It's not even 8 o'clock. Um, so Mysterious Galaxy thankfully asked a fantastic short question, which is, what is your favorite horror movie? Oh, yeah. Mine's easy. It's Scream. I'm a child of the 90s, so right. like that came out. You know, at that exact age, you know, when I was like really in it. And it was that perfect blend of meta humor and horror where they're mm -hmm. like making fun of themselves. They're making fun of their own tropes. And I love when books do that. Like when you live in a book and it is aware of horror movies, it's aware of, you know, the universe romance tropes. You know, if you have a romance character who's aware yeah. of Hallmark movies and they're talking about it, I love that meta thing that they do. So I, for me, it was absolutely scream. I thought that was hysterical and just entertaining. In terms of scariest horror movies, would obviously be the exorcist i already said that like that one is my like the other one would be paranormal activity i love mm -hmm. like paranormal activity and like blair witch those you know where the commercials were just the audience just jumping mm -hmm. that's all they needed to sell that movie they didn't even need to tell you what it was about they just show the horrified look on the audience's face i'm like i'm gonna go see this now yeah. <laughs> so that was those two did it for me too i believe in ghosts i'm telling you i definitely believe in ghosts <laughs> I will go a completely different direction. I will go with Seven. Oh, um, that's oh, a good one. Oh. That movie is so messed good. up. So oh. good. Great at that Lust. creeping tension, the growing dread. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Seven. That's that's great. Like Lust lines up perfectly with what I was saying about like at Law and Order SUV. Like that scene with the Lust character in the porn. No, that was like, I still have, I have like, Trouble that one was that one was jacked oh, up. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, it's <laughs> no the one. No, it's the one where the dude is still alive. That's the one. That one is best. Oh, anyway, yes. yeah. The air <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, I forget, it was like I forget who it was. it was. I think it was gluttony. Yeah. Um, yeah. and and Kevin Spacey apparently is in fact the scariest person on the planet. Conveniently, so. <laughs> Uh, we watch a lot of old horror in our house. My husband is like an aficionado of seventies movies, and so um, we watch a lot of crazy stuff. So I'm gonna I'm gonna plug one old one that you may not have seen, and then one more recent one. So the old one that I'm gonna plug is the original Suspiria. 
Yes, it's in Italian. Yes, you got to read subtitles. It will mess you <laughs> up. It's about like a ballet school for like talented young women. And then there's horrible things happening in the basement. And there's a scene with a room filled with razor wire that will literally make your skin crawl. It is really horrifying. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then on a more recent one, there have been some really amazing horror movies recently. Um, but the one that really got me was Hereditary um, with Tony oh. Collette. Um, that, there is a scene in there involving some piano wire that, <laughs> that is scene, yeah. absolutely horrifying. Like it, it like, yeah. even me and I'm like, I'm old hat at this. <laughs> it was, it was fantastic and it was not necessarily original ideas in horror, original tropes, but it was presented in a really, yes, and the ending, Damien, was. But how about as a mom, that scene when Toni Collette just breaks down yep. and screams and great. I Amazing. was like, like, who stopped at a horror movie? Like, I was like, oh my God, like, I physically felt that she's amazing. And she's the amazing. filmmaker is not, a, is not a woman, but it, but it felt, it, it felt very much about a mother's experience. You know, I think that the, the title hereditary gives you sort of a lot and, and not just her as a mother, but her mother who plays an important part in the movie as well. Um, it's, 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 it's really fantastic and it's really, really scary. So uh, that's it for us. If Mysterious Galaxy wants to come in and say goodbye, Constance, thank you so much. Thank you. And I too. I to all my East Coasters, because I know a lot of you stayed up late and I see your names on there and I appreciate all of you who stayed up and did this. Thank you. Karen. Yes. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to throw out two also horror things. The Hannibal TV series mm -hmm. is so disturbingly yeah. beautiful and creepy and ready or not if you like a good explosive slasher. I'm, you're smiling because I'm guessing you've seen it, Chelsea. Have you seen I'm, it? I'm smiling because I can see Rachel commenting yes, because I knew as soon as you said Hannibal, she was going to get excited. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so good. But thank you to our East Coasters, to our West Coasters, and all non-coasters in between. Um, thank you so very, very much for joining us and celebrating. I, it is always a pleasure to get to celebrate on the actual book birthday. So thank you, Diana, for joining us, for celebrating Small Town Monsters with us. Everyone, spooky season is here! And there is no better way to celebrate. Um, so go read Small Town Monsters. The purchase book button will be down below. Also make sure that you check out Gretchen's books as well as Chelsea's books because all the spooky feely goodness is just going to be in them for you. And thank you so much to our authors for joining us. Gretchen, fearless leader of the evening. Chelsea, <laughs> Diana, it was thank such a pleasure. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>